This episode is brought to you by Fully Gemstones. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou hast trod amongst the stones of fire. Hot stuff. That is fiery and brilliant. And it's what we want to see at the coronation, isn't it? It certainly is. I think we will. I think we'll be all right with our stones of fire. Welcome to If Jewels Could Talk. I'm Carol Walton, the voice of jewellery, an author, broadcaster, and the woman who initiated the role of jewellery editor at magazines like Tatler and British Vogue. This is a podcast for everyone, for people who do like jewellery, for people who don't realise they like jewellery, and anyone intrigued by fascinating facts, new ideas, and forgotten histories. So please join me as I tell sparkly tales, meeting all sorts of people, delving into four centuries of jewellery culture, and investigate what's happening now. I am delighted to welcome back dual polymath historian author, Geoffrey Munn. Geoffrey's definitive book on tiaras, A History of Splendour, has just been republished. And in the run-up to the British coronation, I thought it was the perfect moment to discuss tiaras, crowns, royal regalia, and the coronation. And appropriately, since it's been announced that the Queen Consort will be wearing Queen Mary's crown that's altered for her. It's been removed from the Tower of London to be repaired and have the alterations made. We are talking in the Queen Mary room at Garrard. Garrard is one of the oldest jewellers in the world. They have an illustrious history. They were the crown jeweller from 1843 to 2007. And this room in which we're speaking is the room where Queen Mary was presented with her consort crown, the one that we'll see the present Queen Consort wearing on May the 6th. So the room has been named in her honour. It was named on her 81st birthday in 1948 with the Queen's permission. Geoffrey, welcome to If Jules Could Talk in the Queen Mary room. Well, it's very exciting, isn't it? I mean, they're teeming with ghosts here, isn't it? It's wonderful. Splendid ghosts. And it's incredible to think that she was actually presented with that crown in this very room. Yes, the past is a very difficult place, isn't it? I mean, um, everything about her would have been enormously imposing. And to take that splendour forward, then every sort of jewellery helped enormously, and silks and furs and and, 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 and um, necklaces and bracelets, stomachers, and perhaps above all the tiaras which we are talking about now. I want to talk through a little bit of the history. Each monarch and queen consort usually has their own crown. So this is really breaking with royal tradition, isn't it, to to go back and use somebody else's? Well, I don't know. I think that there's a very strong sense of heritage today, and the heritage of the coronation is fantastically ancient. Um, I've been doing a little bit of homework and discovered that the first coronation in England took place in 975 in Bath, of all places. It then moved to Westminster Abbey, where we are more accustomed to seeing this ritual, this this holy moment taking place. And the first coronation, notable coronation there, um, was from William the Conqueror in 1067, I think. So it's a, a very long reach of tradition. And, of course, the bloodline of our present royal family goes back to William the Conqueror and beyond. So to wear heritage objects of this sort is exactly what everybody wants to see. And um, that may help explain why these choices have been made. Mm. But very exciting. It's going to be a visually hugely exciting, but also emotionally a massive tug on, on, on us all, I think. And do you think it fits with the king's commitment to the environment and to the make, do and mend um, to, to take something that's old and actually adjust it, mend it, repair it and use it. Yeah, I, I can't speak for the king, of course, but I think he's very conscious of the endorsement of majesty. Uh, I think that there's no question at all that, that the um, state receptions, banquets and things haven't been diminished in any sense of the word at all, particularly in the reign of the last queen. And in a sense, it's um, central to, to the mystery of it all, I think, that um, a very ancient tradition, 
bolstered by finery. Now, there's a very important reason why finery, and jewellery in particular, is so significant, um, because in any age but our own, the image of the sovereign was virtually unknown. We see prints emerging in the mid-19th century, and then in comes photography, and then in comes television, and the Christmas broadcast. But before then, people simply didn't recognise Queen Victoria if she was dressed down and going to bed and breakfast places with John Brown in Scotland. They didn't know who she was. So the way to signal the sovereign's presence was through finery and majesty in, in, in every sense of the word. And uh, it was in 1471 that an observer called Sir John Fortescue wrote a book called The Governance of England. And he writes... It shall need that the king have such treasure as he may make new buildings when he will for his pleasure and magnificence, and as he may buy him rich clothes, rich furs, rich stones, and other jewels and ornaments convenient to his estate royal. For if a king did not do so, nor might do, he lived then not like his estate, but rather in misery and in more subjugation than doth a private person. Fifteenth wow. century. It's the absolute cornerstone of what we will see, I think, in a funny way. So he's effectively saying jewels and diamonds make you happy. Oh, well, I suppose, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know whether he's really saying that, but what he's saying possibly is, is that the ownership of finery and estates royal and, and jewellery is a, a, an emblem of power, um, which, of course, is another nub of sovereignty, really. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and when... The sovereign appeared, be it a man or a woman, um, in in this uh, splendour. Then the message was was one of power and and sovereignty, exactly what it means. And so we would expect to see some of that, perhaps not in quite the same level of splendour as we saw it for the late Queen. But I think if it didn't happen, I think the United Kingdom would be rather disappointed, and so would the rest of the world. I completely agree, because actually the crown jewels are, are made up of about a hundred treasures. Mm. And it is, in effect, the royal regalia, the only complete collection of royal regalia used in the world. Yeah, used, I think is absolutely mm. right. I mean, I, I, I was sort of slightly against calling them the crown jewels, quite simply because they are regalia. They have a quasi-sanctity about them. They, they, they are there at the moment of coronation. Um, and coronation is exactly the right word for that moment, but it's the anointing of the sovereign, which is the sacred moment, um, the, the unction, the anointing of the forehead with the holy oil, which signified um, a, a, a pact between God and the divine right of kings. So that's the moment, and that's why it's quite private. A canopy is brought over the sovereign, and the consort to hide the gaze of those congregating there. Um, and, and, and at the moment of the anointing, the robes of the sovereign are removed right down to a sort of linen shift for the late queen and appearing almost naked before God and making her vow, or his vow, to serve the country and God himself. So these are rather <laughs> antique um, emotions, and, um, but, but it is a ritual too, and it will, I don't think the ritual will be broken. Things will change. It's now 70 years since the last coronation and the last anointing of a sovereign. But it's interesting, the anointing happens with one of the oldest pieces mm. in the regalia, which is a 12th century spoon. Yes. It goes all the way back and has anointed every king and queen. Absolutely, yes. And lost during the Commonwealth and then retrieved, actually, because Cromwell sold the regalia. Yes. And, and including that, and I think uh, after the... Uh, uh, restoration of the monarchy, that um, some of these things were returned by those who had bought them. And I think most conspicuously is the Ballas Ruby, known as the Black Prince's Ruby, which is hugely important in the imperial state crown and, and has a magnificent and very ancient history, I think worn by the Black Prince on his helm into battle. Um, so... Goodness, what a, what a heritage that is. But we shouldn't ignore the heritage of the building because I think Mr Fortescue, um, well, he's not Mr, he's Sir John Fortescue, <laughs> would remind us <laughs> that, um, that it's the building too that's desperately yes. important. Well, let's first talk about Queen Mary's crown and mm -hmm. the, the spectacle that these jewels create and the feeling of power 
um, that the Queen Consort wearing Queen Mary's crown will have Cullinan three and four put into the crown, which are incredible stones. Yes, yes, they certainly are. And they were worn as Granny's chips by the late Queen. And you can see her in that splendid interview where she's looking at the Imperial State crown, wearing Cullinan three and four, um, whacking great stones, mm -hmm. actually worn, um, may I say, slightly inexpertly because they were slightly to one side. But it was a belter of an interview and said quite a lot about her relationship with the Imperial State crown. But um, Queen Mary actually wore Cullinan 1 and 2 as a brooch. When I first saw a photograph of well, this... Well, before they were put into yes. the scepter and the orb. Yes. And God, that must have been massive. Well, it absolutely was. Very good for bicycling, because you never get run over if you're wearing that. But the thing is that um, they're, they're huge, massive stones. And, um, and and when I first saw them in the photograph, I thought the, the, the photograph had been enhanced. But it's not so. Um, Cullinan 1 and 2 were mounted by Garrards um, as a brooch for her. And they were later transferred to the scepter, Cullinan mm. 1, I think, and Cullinan 2 for the Imperial State Crown. And then the 3 and 4 look big enough on our late Queen, but Cullinan 1 and 2 was an, an extraordinary dis dis display, I think. But Cullinan I'm not... 1, when it was put into the scepter yes. by Garrard yes. in 1911, they had to reinforce the gold to take the weight of it. Yes, well, that sounds a bit sort of romantic, Carol, <laughs> let's be honest. I mean, you know, <laughs> let's get real here. But um, no, I think probably not. But what I have looked well, at... That's very... what Garrard say. Well, I mean, we just <laughs> couldn't possibly dispute it, could we? But the thing is that, um, well, I had a very, very good look at um, uh, the, the regalia recently. And what I did notice was that the, I don't want to say the remains of it, but the setting of Cullinan II is visible in um, the Imperial State Crown, the original platinum setting. And I think it's possible even in the scepter. So there may have been a feeling at mm. one stage that they could be retrieved to be worn personally, which is a, an extraordinary thought that they didn't just lodge there in the, in, in the crown jewels, but somebody wanted to wear them. Maybe they had to reinforce that setting to ensure it didn't fall out at the inappropriate moment. I'm sure you'll be. <laughs> yes, that's what it was. So it's entirely appropriate that she has these stones. Yes. And um, you were talking to me earlier about the impression that the Cullinan had at the Queen Elizabeth's coronation and how it was almost too dazzling for the film that they were trying to, to create. Yes. It's absolutely true. I mean, the refracted light from diamonds that's so enticing, and it actually breaks up white light into coloured light. But but it is um, a, a, a piercing, really. And, um, and, and I think at that stage of filming for television, the cameras and the film, if you like, were a bit rattled by this. And if you look at it, it's quite blurred. Um, it hasn't come through at all well. And that shows the power of it at that time. And I think adds something to the mystery of it. Don't forget everybody in the nation was huddling around 20 people in a drawing room looking at one tiny television set and seeing this whacking great stone mm. burning a hole in the front of it. I mean, that's pretty pretty good stuff. But but uh, no, I, I, I was very lucky to go to the state opening of Parliament once and um, I was sitting right up in the gods and, and next to a dead pigeon, I remember, in the rafters and one or two <laughs> other good things. But anyway, um, <laughs> the... Um, you know the, your place. Oh, no, I do. I found it. <laughs> too <laughs> and um, so, so uh, no it, it was uh, it, there was no problem about that at all the diamond in the front of the imperial state crown because it was coming out like a sort of laser and hitting me right up in the gods and going left right and center right over the center of the head of the sovereign um giving a very interesting um, subliminal message. Also, I think this message of very of precious stones is is fascinating. They're numinous. They're practically vision-inducing on that level. And somehow or another, deep in our subconscious, we recognise that they're also a memento mori because they, some of these stones are not millions of years old, but billions of years old. Igneous stones made when the earth was molten. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. And then, in the last flashlight bulb of their existence, there something called man comes along has just crawled up the beach and um, you know as a sort of primeval little reptile <laughs> read it and evolved a bit <laughs> just a bit and and then um finds it and laps it and and suddenly turns it into this this very strange manifestation of natural beauty there's something deep in our psyche that recognizes these things are going to go on 
until the black hole returns, they will look this way, but we are just fleeting shadows. And, and um, it's a very interesting subliminal fascination and raises us above the rest of the animal kingdom. And links in to the fact that uh, it stretches back, that sort of time, mm. the, the thousand-year history of the monarchy. Yes, can only be embodied by these stones. Yes, and that business of recognition I do think is quite important because they're always incredibly costly objects. They always have been because they're so fascinating and so rare. So the message coming from sovereignty is that, yes, we've acquired these, we bought them, we have them, and, um, and we are powerful. We were given them. Given them, absolutely. And then we have the power to protect them. A very eloquent survival of all of this. It can be seen by anybody at any time. If you take the number three bus opposite the Palace of Westminster, the most venerable palace in the United Kingdom, on the other side of the road, a little square Romanesque building, which doesn't catch the eye terribly much, but it's the jewel keep of King Edward III. And the regalia was kept there um, uh, certainly uh, on and off until the reign of Henry VIII. And it was one of the very few buildings that survived the fire of um, the Palace of Westminster, which I think was 1836. And so it's a very haunted place because it's emblematic of the fact that the sovereign keeps his regalia close to the Palace of Westminster, the premier palace of the United Kingdom, and it's guarded and can be used quite conveniently just over the road and there it is so anybody can see this everybody does see it and what's Nobody it takes used it. for now Jeffrey? It's a, I don't think it's used for anything except charging people eight pounds to go around it we'll go there together darling. we'll go together yeah. well I think we feel a podcast coming on we'll go take the number three bus together we will we will we'll do a podcast there yes number three bus is quite it's a bit of a by story but it's actually a rather haunted one because it also goes over the site of the execution of King Charles the first over the site of it, not round it. So, so that's a, uh, not, it's a bit far removed from what we're talking about. Well, it's not far removed mm. because when you think of it, it's because King Charles the first mm-hmm. was executed, yes. that the most of the royal regalia disappeared yeah. and that it had to be recreated for the coronation of Charles II. And the imperial state crown was made then and has become part of history. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, that was um, nothing short of miraculous. I suppose we had a restoration, really. So, so, so no, it is, it is very remarkable um, that, that, that we have this holy moment, this ritual that's going to be presented to us and in a way... Uh, to the entire world with an air of deep sanctity and heritage that's completely unparalleled, really. So the first crown everyone will see is when the king is on his way to the abbey and he will have the imperial state crown on his head. And that is the one with these ancient stones, the oldest in Christendom, the Black Princess Ruby that is actually a spinel, um, the Stuart Sapphire. Yes. And it is... As you say, at that moment of coronation, that sacred moment, that the the imperial state crown will be taken off and he will be crowned with the St Edward's crown. And then I think it's not worn again, uh, the St Edward's crown, um, which is again endorsing this this, this air of sanctity, Edward the Confessor's crown. I mean, that's... um you know, really part and parcel of what we're, we're talking about. But also just to return to the situation where all these jewels are going to be blazing and this holy moment, this sacrament, mm. it is a sacrament, just like baptism and marriage. It is a sacrament. It's an extremely rare one. We haven't seen it for 70 years, but it is one. It takes place on the Cosmati pavement, um, which is built for Henry the Third. Um, And it's 700 years old. It was finished in 1268. And it has emblems of the cosmos going around it. So the site of the anointing and probably the coronation is a curious sort of slab of marble, which seems to have mist and clouds swirling around it. And it's an orb. It's the centre of the cosmos. And the king is sitting there as he's sat for nearly a thousand years, following a tradition as old as that. And it's hugely significant. It was in very, very bad repair, even in Queen Victoria's time, and the carpet was thrown over it for decades. Um, But it's recently been restored, and there's going to be a great privilege for those that are interested that later on they'll be able to walk on this 
Cosmati pavement, as long as they take their shoes off and keep their socks on, I'm going to be first in the queue because, <laughs> my goodness, what a hair-raising place it is. I've gazed at it many, many times. I go to Westminster Abbey and see the sight of that majesty, really, and... Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a holy moment. I don't, I don't think one can stress that too much, really, jewels aside. And it is the bloodline of the sovereign that's so fascinating, too. Most notably from Mary, Queen of Scots, which is um, a very back-to-front thing because she is buried there next to Queen Elizabeth I in adjoining chapels. But, of course, it was Elizabeth that brought her to the block. But her revenge, if you like, was the fact that ever since her reign, um, the British sovereignty um, has descended from her mm-hmm. and not from, from Elizabeth. And so they are they, the, the bloodline is impressive, to say the very least. And actually, it's interesting, a fact that you said you talked about the power and significance of the jewels, but also that they were important to make sure, and part of the ceremony is to make sure the king is the king because who knew who the king was absolutely because we're returning to the fact that the image of the king was really only available to the subjects on the coinage which is a highly stylized portrait in those days anyway so it was perfectly possible for a sovereign to travel incognito abroad in fact queen victoria did this when she went to France, she called herself La Comtesse de Balmoral. I'm not the Countess of Balmoral. Well, I don't think it's very convincing. But anyway, um, she could do that, and, and because nobody frankly knew who she was. That's all aside, but the main danger at a coronation is that somebody's going to slip in an imposter. And, and so I think we will probably see that um, there'll be a declaration of, this is Charles, um, your undoubted king, and there will be a sense of parading this undoubted king to the congregation so that anybody at the last chance could leap up and say this is an imposter not terribly likely since the poor chap's been filmed incessantly since birth but in previous generations that might have occurred absolutely because um the locking up of relatives people pushing their own yes line the family to the fore yes went on and murdering them in the tower mm. the princes mm. in the tower that's a you know pretty good way of getting them out of the way i suppose yeah mm. so So, this great crown, this historic crown that goes back to Edward the Confessor, Mm. studded with rubies, amethysts, peridots, sapphires, will be placed on his head. And the late Queen talked a lot about how heavy crowns were. She thought Mm. they were very important, but quite heavy. That crown weighs five pounds. Yes. I mean, do you think he's been practising? Getting his, strengthening his neck in preparation. Well, I think it's established fact that the late Queen um, uh, did practice wearing it, certainly the night before and probably before that. But I, I, I think, yes, they, they are heavy, but I think there's a misunderstanding about the weight of jewellery. Um, it's really not that bad, you know. I mean, uh, you know, everybody saw that necklace would be so heavy and, and that bracelet was it's just a nonsense, really. Mainly, they're quite light. They're lighter often earlier periods because they're made of gold and silver and platinum can be quite hefty, but we're not going to see platinum in, in the coronation. But no, I think... Um, but it's solid gold. Gold only, is heavy. Well, it's not solid because it's all pierced and, mm. and um, you know, uh, the, worst, the worst kind of jewellery is, is heavy jewellery and one looks for lightness and settings and I think that what is possible would have been made possible in the construction of those crown so I don't want to hear too many complaints from anybody about the weight of their crowns because but actually um, you've got no sympathy none whatsoever none at all except that Shakespeare did in Henry the fourth and he says heavy is the head that wears the crown and of course there's an enormous sense of duty and responsibility associated with this majesty but um, heavy is the head that wears the crown and I think that that's so true it's an inescapable trap really that they're born into this and mm. with it comes grinding duty and shed loads of boredom I'm sure and so lifelong it, service working as the yeah, late queen did yes, every day truly astonishing yes quite astonishing but it is also I think that that brings us neatly back to the anointing, the chrism, the holy oil going onto the forehead, because that signifies a bond, a vow to the Almighty, 
that, that you're, you're going to do it until you die. And so I think that um, all that speculation about abdication was completely fruitless because that was clearly not going to happen and I don't think it ever will happen. Now I'm sitting, as we're sitting in Garrard and thinking about their history as the crown jeweller, the crown jeweller is now called Mark Appleby and he is a master craftsman at Mappin and Webb, another great British jewellery institution. Now how panic struck must he be right now? <laughs> I mean he is the man who can hold these jewels, who's entrusted with creating them and creating them quickly because the Queen Mary crown was only taken out relatively recently. Yes, I mean, I can't speak with any um, authority on all of that, but I expect there is a sense of... um apprehension because we want everything to go very well at almost any other coronation uh, apart from the late queens uh, if things went wrong then it was rather private matter queen victoria couldn't get the coronation ring onto her finger and they had to ram it on there to make sure that happened and alexandra's coronation i think the his chain of office fell off onto the floor and everybody gasped with horror and um, with reason there. So this is um, definitely going to raise the stakes about the ritual. And I'm sure that there have been endless rehearsals for everybody to, to make sure that that doesn't happen under the BDI of the camera. So it's even more unfortunate situation for the sovereign today than it was in more earlier. Stressful, yes, yes, yes. And for the grand jeweller. Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think at, at the late Queen's wedding, I mean, her Russian fringe tiara she was wearing broke. It did, I've heard two that. Two hours before. Yes. And apparently the Queen Mother had some marvellous comment like, well, we've got time and there are other tiaras. Yes, <laughs> and it was rushed back to the Garrow workshop to mend. And well, I'm not sure. I did hear, but then it's, of course, these things do get amplified. But I heard a bit of fuse wire was used, which I thought was an absolutely brilliant idea because I'm involved with that sort of thing. And fuse wire um, isn't visible and works jolly nicely. So I think that's perfectly credible that somebody went round it with fuse wire. So we hope Mark Appleby won't have to get out the fuse wire anyway on May the 6th. Well, I think he should certainly carry <laughs> some in his pocket so anyway just in case yes there's a robing room at the palace of westminster and i think that that's the moment when the imperial state crown is given to the sovereign as queen mary came here yes and queen mary would have come to have fittings to try it, to mm. be presented with it now she she really really was very passionate about jewelry wasn't she i'd like to turn that on its head a tiny bit because her posthumous reputation is extremely irritating to me because wherever you go and you give a talk about jewellery in some sort of scout hut in the country, they always say uh, that Queen Mary was sort of avaricious and greedy and even to the extent of being a kleptomaniac. Well, it's absolute nonsense, really. What they're being led by is some biography, and I'm not quite sure what, whose that was, that described her as being what she was, which was curatorial. Um, she was um, a great-granddaughter of King George III. I'm hoping I've got that right and um, a very royal descent. So royal both ways, through marriage and through lineage. Yes. And when the royal family marries out, then some of the relics, if you like, uh, some of the objects that were significant, seem to ebb into the commercial world. The Duke of Cambridge had to sail, and I think she was very um, upset by that and commissioned an agent to buy from that sale. Anyway, she was very exercised by that because uh, as she could see family relics being sold and commissioned various dealers and even her friend Lady Mount Temple to buy these things. But she was fascinated by precious metalwork and by jewellery and possibly because sometimes they're imbued with these attributes we just described. But everybody would say, well, so what? But what can be said of her is that she had a very firm understanding of it because the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths here, the livery company in London, invited her to join a committee uh, to advise on the revival of the art of enamelling here in the United Kingdom. So uh, obviously it was very prestigious just to have her there, but she wouldn't have done it if she felt she couldn't contribute anything towards it. Mm -hmm. So her focus was on goldsmith's work, but that included 18th century gold snuff boxes and the inevitable Fabergé things, as well as the jewellery. But having said that, um, she was also very interested in porcelain. Now, if she'd only been interested in porcelain, I don't think this posthumous criticism would have happened, or if she'd focused on paintings. It's just that jewellery is covetable, and that's what people seem to react against, that, that this was a, a, a sovereign who was covetous rather than curatorial, and curatorial she absolutely was. 
at Garrard here, we're looking at some of the archive models of tiaras they've actually made, and there is the Russian fringe tiara here, isn't there? Yes. She, she wanted to buy Russian treasures, didn't she, that had been owned by part of essentially her family? Yes, they were. Well, they were certainly her husband's mm. family, first cousins of King George V, and does illustrate the point when things were sold by the revolutionary government. The Russians were selling treasures for tractors, they said, um, because they were broke, the revolutionary government, and so they sold the Russian crown jewels at Christie's, at least in part, in 1927. Mm. And she did, she did buy there, not terribly much, but she bought um, actually a German snuff box encrusted with diamonds, I think, and um, some good things. So I, I think she was trying to, to retrieve all of that. So now, obviously, as we talked about, a, a different age, understandably, Queen Mary wanted to amass a lovely collection of tiaras because she wore them and was wearing them for dinner every night. And your book's just been republished of tiaras, and it's the definitive guide if anyone is interested in tiaras, which they should be. I'm wondering why. I mean, you and I love jewellery, and of course we can read about tiaras all day and look at them. Why do you think people are mesmerised by them? Why do you think it's relevant now that people need to read about tiaras? Well, it's very strange because when I was 19, I joined a firm of jewellers called Wartsky, and their note paper was blazing with royal warrants at the time. They had uh, Greece and Denmark and the Queen and Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and some references to Queen Mary. And it's up and down Bond Street with the old established traditional jewellers like Garrard's and a number of others, I have to say, now long gone Tessier. Tiaras were simply what you did. So I arrived when age 19 and I saw the most astounding one in Watsky's safe, which was from the French crown jewels made for the Duchess of Angoulême, who was the daughter of Louis XVI, and it had huge emeralds and diamonds in it, 1,041 brilliant diamonds and 44 emeralds, and it was in a sort of shoebox thing. And age 19, I opened this up, and it was like Brock's benefit, like a firework display. I'd never seen anything like it. I felt immediately guilty and slammed the lid closed and, um, and came back later on. Why did and you feel guilty? Because I felt that I was intruding on something, oh, certainly intruding on something I'd <laughs> never, ever, ever seen before and to close on close quarters and um, it was an astounding experience but having said that it's just what we did it's kind of illustrated because by the, everybody was selling them at that point well they, they had them and they maintained them it was already perhaps going slightly downhill but the interesting thing about some of the best tiaras is they come off a frame and you can turn them upside down and wear them as a necklace Perhaps if we were talking about necklaces right now, perhaps we wouldn't be quite as fascinated as we are with the tiaras. And I think the reason is slightly back to front because there is an implication, the strongest implication, that only noble women can wear and royal women can wear tiaras. This is a nonsense. Anybody can wear them. And the only stipulation is that the invitation should suggest that you should wear them. And that is usually formal evening wear, white, white tie. tie. We call it mm. white tie now. Mm. And then the men would have morning coats and their medals and off we would go. And then these things came out and some of them are absolutely enormous scale. Of course they are. And I suppose in an uneven society, which it most definitely was, you'd expect to see the duchesses in tiaras with tremblant settings like drops of water on the end of a tap oscillating mm. and flaring in front of you and so they were the strongest implication of nobility and as I say that's a nonsense because if the invitation was issued to a missus she would be expected to wear a tiara too. Mrs Greville at Polston Lacey had magnificent jewellery which she left to Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother and she was just a missus the honourable missus if you like but but anyway and um, so it's a democratic subject anybody can do this but you have to choose your moment. The moment is now difficult because these great receptions are not happening. And so the opportunity of wearing them is narrowed down almost exclusively to weddings and one or two very rare occasions throughout Europe, perhaps, but here at the state opening of Parliament and the Lord Mayor's banquet. But Mrs. will be there, be sure. So any Mrs. listening right now, you can do it. I think the fascination and the implication of nobility and royalty comes from the fact that tradition is the cornerstone of royalty, which we've already discussed. We want the royal family to do exactly as they've done and always done. We don't want change. And so the royal family wear tiaras, as they've always done, as a nod to that. 
And so somewhere along the line, everybody thinks, so oh, I've got to be, you know, at least a princess to wear one. No, they're totally democratic. Will we see lots at this coronation? I hope we will. I um, hope we will, but I'm, I'm worried that we won't, yeah. and I hope a lot of people going will go to the trouble to get hold of one. Borrow yes, one. Yes, indeed. Find one, loan one, yes. wear a fake one. It doesn't matter, but no. wear something. <laughs> wear something. I think that I think it'll be all right. I think you needn't worry, Carol. I think you'll you'll be Good. fine. That's and, my main concern. Well, obviously. I know it's a very <laughs> pressing concern in everyday life. So anyway, it's perfectly ridiculous to <laughs> describe any kind of jewellery as democratic, and even more ridiculous to describe tiaras as that. But there mm. is huge magic to it. And at, at Cartier in 1911 they had um, an exhibition of 11 tiaras that make money for a foundation in memory of Queen Mary's brother, Prince Francis of Teck, who had died only hardly a year before. And there were 11 tiaras, and they charged a golden guinea to get in. And they were associated with the coronation. And the queues went all the way down the road here, where we're sitting, down Bond Street to go and see them. And I smelt the coffee rather a long time later and decided to have an exhibition of tiaras at Wartsky uh, in aid of Samaritans, the charity. And I wasn't quite happy with 11, so I had 111 tiaras stuffed in that tiny shop there. And I had six of British royal provenance and two designed by Albert for Queen Victoria. And I thought, well, yes, it's going to be powerful, but I absolutely didn't understand how powerful. And I had my cue going. I all remember. Around. I remember. Yeah. It was, we'll never see so many together again like that. Not likely, no. Right on the last day of this exhibition, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mother, visited, age 97. And there they were, rammed into a very small room, really. And very touchingly, she went straight past them to go and greet a woman who, who had multiple sclerosis, who was in a wheelchair and was Scottish, and shook her hand and began to talk about Edinburgh and saw everybody and walked out again. <laughs> and so um, that was a very magic moment for everybody. But, but she'd she, seen enough tiaras I was going in to her say, time. <laughs> well, that's very much the point I'm making. Yeah, I mean... I think um, so, so magic for everybody else, but, but in a sense probably um, a, a tradition for the royal family and for the nobility. Some of the, it's difficult to describe the scale of some of these jewels, which is what they are, and the way to do it probably is to go to the jewellery gallery at the Victoria and Albert Museum if you can and see the Cartier tiara for the Duchess of Manchester, who was called the Double Duchess because she married two dukes. Not at the same time, because not, not allowed. But anyway, um, so married two dukes. And, um, and there this thing is, and there are pendant diamonds hanging there freely. So you've only got to walk past the showcase and off they go, firing light. I just can't think what a nightmare it would have been sitting opposite her at dinner because, you know, she'd be babbling away like a brook. and it Moving would her head. And <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So your book on tiaras, obviously there's a huge, huge chapter on the people who are sort of pivotal yeah. at, at the moment in their life of bringing the tiara back from antiquity, Napoleon and Josephine. Yes. And it was really crucial, wasn't it, the tiara uh, to make an impact on the world at their coronation? Yes, I think it's true. I mean, certainly he identified as a classical emperor, Roman emperor. There are references all over the place there against the Bourbon dynasty, against it, relating himself to something much more antique, which he had no claim to whatsoever. So it, it was a return to classicism, and most of these head ornaments have their roots in antiquity. They fit neatly into three categories. So there are garlands, which are based on floral, obviously floral types, roses and forget-me-nots and that sort of thing. And then there are diadems, um, and the diadem is actually very closely related to the sort of helm of a helmet, the bit that goes down in front of the face, the triangular form, which was worn by both men and women in antiquity to signal power and rank. And uh, so you see goddesses wearing them in sculpture, and you see them later on in imaginary scenes of the mountain of the gods, if you like. So, so um, but those are diadems, and they have this significantly triangular shape at the front. And then there's the third type, which is really belongs most of all to Russia, called the kokoshnik, which is um, based on a traditional Russian headdress that comes parallel to the face, round and about the head, like a starburst, a sunburst. Yes, it, yeah, around all yes. This, yes. And they were more often made of paper and leather and and um, very humble materials. But in Russia, uh, and certainly by the late 19th and early 20th century, they were referencing this traditional form um, by making it in 
precious stones. And, and so you see, not terribly politically correct, but peasant jewellery turned by the alchemist's wand into the most valuable and extravagant jewels you can ever imagine. But at their coronation, it really was the tiara and the jewellery, because they, going back to your point about it's a democratic dual form, yes. um, they were a very ordinary family weren't they? And Josephine's family. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. And how did he elevate them all into these, this royal family? Yes. And he did it with tiaras. Well, no, he was absolutely, well, and everything else, mm. and with ermine and cloth of gold and um, every, every possible decorative device they could think of. Um, Josephine had some royal blood, and in fact, she, um, her first husband was, was guillotined, and it was only by an absolute hair's breadth that she was, she was spared that. But um, and, and escaped the guillotine in eight day, uh, only eight days away. She was going to have her head yes. chopped off. But anyway, so it was a very, very nouveau riche uh, establishment that needed the endorsement of finery and spectacle above all things. Catherine the Great had, in order to be recognised, um, she thought it was prudent to cover herself with precious stones and then get on a horse. And then the horse furniture, the bridles and the bits, were uh, absolutely emblazoned with emeralds as well. So the horse got to wear the jewellery when she came out. <laughs> and tiara, I think tiara for great. the horse. Yeah, Nicholas I had a, a saddle cloth entirely bedizened with uh, uh, diamond flowers. Um, but when, of course, he's gone now, and the saddle cloth survives in the Hermitage Museum. But there's a place for his bottom and his legs. But where the, everywhere else is just covered in diamonds. So the horse he came out into the sun... And he was seeing a spectacle of almost supernatural intensity. I mean, that's really, really exciting, I think. There was, a, there was a one poor boy who was taken, um, I think I've related this in the book somewhere, but he, he was a, 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 a boy from perhaps Uzbekistan or any periphery of the Russian Empire, um, was brought to the court of, um, uh, uh, in Russia and worked for the Yusupov family, who are legendary. Very well. rich, very wealthy. Exactly. And um, Princess Yusupova had, needless to say, a staggering collection of jewellery. She was in the other room dressing for dinner. Meanwhile, the poor boy had been had his peasant clothes transmuted into silk. His only job was to stand in the corridor and say absolutely nothing, like a piece of porcelain, uh, and bow when she came out. When she did come out, covered in these splendid jewels, he had never seen anything like them, as indeed I hadn't, and, um, and he um, was completely terrified of her, fell on his knees and curled up like a hedgehog and couldn't be persuaded to come out because he thought she was a goddess. And so that's the intensity of, 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 of these arrangements. Very, very peculiar. But talking about weight, in the book, you tell the story that when Napoleon tried on mm. the laurel leaf yes. headpiece that he was going to wear with each leaf yes. representing a victory... He thought it was too heavy. Yes. And he said to the yes. goldsmith, forget some of my triumphs, and six leaves were removed. Yes, I think it's true. <laughs> I think one or two of them do survive. And I suppose that is a case of um, them being, uh, they're not solid gold, but they are So gold. do you think Napoleon should have manned up and uh, yeah. he should have accepted that weight? Well, I'm surprised he didn't. But I'm, <laughs> I'm, I suppose all the, all the state robes and God knows what else are. And the golden bees and yeah, everything and the, 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 he had. Very cumbersome and... Um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very curious tradition, but a very powerful one. I think that's the point. And, um, and, and, and there is, Aldous Huxley said that certain categories of works of art were numinous. It's a wonderful word, this. It means that they're vision-inducing. And he said right at the top of a number of numinous categories of art sits jewellery, um, because he says every paradise in every religion is furnished with precious stones. And he quotes the prophet Ezekiel, who says, mm. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou hast trod amongst the stones of fire. Hot stuff. That is fiery and brilliant. And it's what we want to see at the coronation, isn't it? It certainly is. I think we will. I think we'll be all right with our stones of fire. They do originate from fire. All, well, that's not all true. I mean, the, the harder the gemstone, the more likely it is to be igneous, to come from volcanic activity. But then, of course, we will expect to see some organic material, which are the pearls, and they are something quite separate. And as I say, they are organic. Uh, they're not minerals, um, but they have a, a magic all of their own. 
And the most important factor, as you say, these treasures are recognized around the world because they are the ones that are retained by a royal family and still worn by them. Yeah, and, and, and there is a still a very strong sense of curatorial responsibility at, um, in the royal collections, much more than there was even in my time. And, um, and that's, that's good. So we don't expect to see um, remodeling. What was important in the past was um, that people didn't want older things. I think older is not quite the right word, but they didn't want unfashionable things. So for instance, when Prince Felix Yusupov married, he took his bride to Chaumet in Paris with the ancestral Yusupov jewelry and had it all broken down and remodeled in, in, in contemporary taste for her. Now, this is like knocking down, you know, St. James's Palace, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we don't know what that was. Now we're confronted with jewellery made in the 20th century of the stones that belong to, to the Yusupovs. And, and that, that's heartbreaking. We won't see that in the Royal Collection today. Um, but in almost every generation before, we did see it, even in 1900. Mm -hmm. And, and um, intrinsic value is almost the enemy of the jewellery historian because um, it's constantly being remodelled. When, when the French crown jewels were sold in 1884, they were bought here, there and everywhere, sometimes by the trade. But Lady Paget, an American millionaireess, married to Sir Arthur Paget here in London, um, went to the Devonshire House Ball. Devonshire House was literally 300 yards away from where we are now. It was the most extravagant Jubilee Ball and um, she spent £4,000 on her dress with worth for that night alone and wore what was described as the jewellery from the French crown jewels. But the tragedy was she'd had them remounted. So what she really meant was, I have the gemstones from the French crown jewels, but with them was swept out all the, the fascination of previous and the history. generations. Yeah. So a magical thing, the Devonshire House Ball. I think if you really want to know about sumptuary, <laughs> it's there. And it's now where Green Park Underground Station is, um, was where the Devonshire House was. And it was the most elaborate, costly, extravagant display. And it was a fancy dress ball. Mm. So you go as Cleopatra or um, uh, as Napoleon or whatever and commission couturiers and jewellers to make things for that one night alone. But you're reassuring me we're going to see not just from from the king and queen, but the wider family and the guests, we are going to have a dual spectacle. Well, I'm reassuring you, but I can't be certain. <laughs> <laughs> Geoffrey, thank you very much for sharing all that, that history with us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks. For this and other episodes of If Jewels Could Talk, please go to our website, carolwoolton.com slash podcasts and do subscribe to the podcast feed and share it any way you can and we'd love to have a rating and a comment. I really hope you enjoyed listening to our coronation specials as much as I enjoyed recording them and speaking with my guests. This is the last in our current series of If Jules Could Talk but we will be back sparkling and glittering with many more stories that are in our pipeline very soon so keep your ears out and in the meantime do go to our back catalogue because we have so many to share with you so many stories and so many fabulous guests and lots of surprises in store so i'll be talking with you soon and thank you for listening goodbye if jewels could talk with carol Walton is produced by natasha cowan music and editing by tim thornton Graphics by Scott Bentley, illustration by Geordie Labanda, and you can find me on Instagram at Carol Walton. Mm -hmm.